Uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. Um, famous words from a famous book that has been banned uh, many times over the decades. There are some mornings when I wake up and I wonder if those words have more resonance than they have in, had in a very, very long time. Uh, at a time when everything that is factual can be construed as fake news and all sorts of other contradictions abound. Um, the importance of being able to speak out has never been as critical as it is right now. Um, fortunately, we have not gotten to the point that is in 1984 because we're here today, we're here, we're able to celebrate banned books. Um, but the, the one point I want to make before handing it over to all the great authors we have tonight is to emphasize that these banned books might seem like those are things that don't happen here happen in these other, you know, small towns in the Midwest or somewhere else. And we don't hear that many stories here in Rhode Island about banned books, but I think it's really, really important to understand and recognize that censorship has many forms, and it's not just the banning of books. And the censorship takes place right in our own communities all the time. Uh, for example, uh, in a city like Cranston, uh, you can stand on a uh, According to the city council, they believe you should have the right to stand on a roadway median with a huge sign saying "Go Packs." But if you have a similar, if you have a sign just as large that says "I'm homeless, can you please help me?" That's illegal. Um, you can live in a town like North Smithfield and have your town council decide that they're going to stop purchasing products from a company because the face of its ad campaign is a well-known political protester. These are the things going on right here. And it really is essential for those of you who care about freedom of speech and freedom of the press, freedom to read, um, to speak out when these incidents happen. One of the things that I've been most pleased about in both the instances I mentioned is that residents came out uh, at the council meetings to express their vehement opposition to what the, the councils were doing. In one instance, here in Cranston, it didn't matter, and so we're in court over it. Uh, in the other, as you all know, within a week, the town backed down. And it was because people were exercising their First Amendment rights to speak out. And I want to encourage you to keep on doing that. And I now just want to hand it over to, to the authors so we can bask in, um, in this nice light of being able to speak out uh, despite the controversial nature of books. Thank you. He's probably best known for his children's books depicting families with gay parents. His book Daddy's, Daddy's Roommate from 1990 was the second most challenged book, uh, book in American libraries in the 1990s. And um, it was the first children's book to feature two gay men as parents. Please not welcome Michael Wilhoy, who will read from The Hamlet by William Faulkner. Oh, back on stage again. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. First, I'd like to thank uh, Adrienne and the whole library invited us here tonight, and also to the ACLU, of which I'm a very enthusiastic uh, believer. Okay, this is from uh, the first, the first, of the, the, uh, the first volume in the Strengths Trilogy by, by Paul, it's called The Hamlet. And um, I'm reading a part where Jody Barner is trying to get his younger sister to go to school. But the brother insisted that she go to school. She still declined to walk there, sitting supine and female and soft and immovable, and not even thinking, and apparently not even listening either. While the battle between her mother and brother roared over her tranquil head. So at last, the Negro man who had used to carry her when her mother went visiting would bring up the family Surrey and drive her the half mile to school and would be waiting there with the Surrey at noon and at three o'clock when school is missed. This lasted about two weeks. Mrs. Barner got stopped it because it was too wasteful, like firing up a 20 gallon pot to make a bowl of soup would be wasteful. She delivered an ultimatum. If Jody wanted his sister to go to school, he would have to see that she got there himself. 
she suggested that since he rode his horse to and from the store every day and how he might carry Eula to and from school behind him. The daughter sitting there again, neither thinking nor listening while this roar into the cuss of the old stable lane. Sitting on the front porch in the mornings with the cheap oil cloth for the starter, Book Satchel they had bought her until her brother rode the horse up to the gallery edge and snarled at her to come and mount behind him. He would carry her to the school and go and fetch her at noon and carry her back afterward and be waiting when school was out for the day. This lasted for almost a month. Then Jody decided that she should walk the 200 yards to the schoolhouse to the store and meet him there. To his surprise, she agreed without protest. This lasted for exactly two days. On the second afternoon, the brother fetched her home on a fast single foot, bursting into the house and standing over his mother in the hall, trembling with anger and outrage, shouting, no wonder she agreed to so, so quick to walk to school and, and meet me, he cried. If you could arrange to have a man standing every 100 feet along the road, she would walk all the way home. She's just like a dog. Since she passes anything in the long pants, she begins to give off something. You can smell it. You can smell it ten feet away. Bill Stitch, Mrs. Barnard said. Besides, don't worry me with it. It was human since she had to go to school. It wasn't me. I raised eight other daughters. I thought they turned out pretty well. But I'm willing to agree that maybe a 27-year-old bachelor knows more about them than I do. Anytime you want to learn to quit school, I reckon you and your pa and me will put forward the check. Did you bring me that cinnamon? No, Judge said, I forgot it. Try to remember it tonight, I've already needed it. So she no longer began the homeward journey to the store. Her brother would be waiting for her at the schoolhouse. It had been almost five years now since this site had become an integral part of the village's life four times a day and five days a week. The roan horse bearing the seething and angry man and the girl of whom, even at nine and 10 and 11, there was too much, too much of leg, too much of breast, too much of buttock, too much of mammalian and female meat, which in conjunction with the tawdry oil cloth, oil cloth receptacle, uh, that was obviously a grammar school grade school, this capital, was a travesty and paradox on the whole idea of education. Even while sitting behind her brother on the horse, the inhabitant of that meat seemed to lead two separate and distinct lives as infants in the act of nursing do. There was one Eula Barnard who supplied blood and nourishment to the buttocks, and legs, and breasts. There was the other Eula Barnard who merely inhabited them, who went where they went because it was less trouble to do so, who was comfortable there, but in their doing she intended to have no part, as you are in a house which you did not design, but where the furniture is all set, set and the rent paid up. On the first morning, Barner had put the horse into a fast trot to get it over the quick. But almost at once, he began to feel the entire body behind him, which, even motionless, in a chair, seemed to postulate an invincible abhorrence of straight lines, jigging its component boneless curves against his back. He had a vision of himself transporting not only across the village's horizon, but across the embracing proscenium of the entire inhabited world, like the sun itself a kaleidoscopic convolution of a man animated man ellipses. So he would walk the horse. He would have to, the sister clutching the cross of his suspenders on the back of his coat with one hand and holding the hoof satchel with, with the other, passing the store where the usual quota of men would be squatting and sitting, past Mrs. Little John's veranda where there would usually be an itinerant drummer or a horse trader, and Barner, now believing, convinced that he knew what they were that why they were there too, the real reason why they had driven 20 miles from Jefferson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Jean Walton is our second reader. She's a professor at the University of Rhode Island, and she has two books coming out in quick succession. Buffalo Trace, A Threefold Vibration, co-authored with Mary Capello, who's actually who's also reading tonight, and James Morrison, and Mud Flat Dreaming, Waterfront, Waterfront Battles and the Squatters Who Fought Them in 1970s Vancouver. Please welcome Jean Walton, reading from Despised and Rejected by Rose Palatini. Sorry for you. You know, I don't mean it as an insult. 
What is to become of you, though? She smiled wearily. I suppose I, too, just go on. Yes, I'm afraid you're the symbol of what has to be sacrificed to the love between <coughs> man and man. He couldn't have done otherwise. Loyally, she was prepared to defend Dennis against anything that even his friend might have to say about him. He was made like that, and he made things more difficult for himself by bottling up all his thoughts and feelings, and being terribly afraid of them, and never telling anyone about them until he told me. He never told me, said Barnaby, at least not in so many words, but I could see for myself. He's got a queer strain of the maternal in him. It's obvious in the way he looks upon his work, and in the way he looks upon that boy. It's a woman's passion as well as a man's that he feels for Alan, virile, and yet tender, stronger even than death or madness, a wonderful motive force that might accomplish much. Only the world would condemn it as an evil, vicious growth that should be stamped out. And then he goes on. Perhaps these men who stand midway between the extremes of the two sexes are the advance guard of a more enlightened civilization. They're despised and rejected of their fellow men today. What they suffer in a world not yet ready to admit their right to existence, their right to love, no normal person can realize. But I believe that the time is not so far distant when we shall recognize in the best of our intermediate types, the leaders and masters of the race. From them, a new humanity is being evolved. And then in the process of evolution, nature produces all sorts of poor little deformities and abnormalities as samples. They're necessary to the production of the higher type, though, and the bad specimens put out from every factory or workshop. Bad specimens, yet forerunners. For out of their suffering, out of pain and confusion and darkness will rise something great, something God-given, and human soul complete in itself, perfectly balanced, not limited by the psychological bounds of one sex, but combining the power and the intellect of the one with the subtlety and intuition of the other, a dual nature possessing the extended range, the attributes of both sides, and therefore loving and beloved of both alike. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jean. Um, next up we have Mike Snim. Um, he is an author and professor of journalism at the University of Connecticut. He worked for years as an investigative reporter for the Providence Journal, and he's the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Prince of Providence, a biography of Buddy Cianci. His most recent book, Unbeaten, Rocky Marciano's, Marciano's Fight for Perfection in a Crooked World, was published this summer. Please help me welcome Mike Stanton, who will read from Howell by Alan Ginsberg. Thank you. Just try to imagine this dimly lit room, or is it just somewhere faded? It's interior. They are in a coffee house in San Francisco in the mid 1950s at the birth of the Beat Generation. And Alan Ginsberg, the poet, uh, wrote this poem, Howl, um, after taking peyote for the first time. And he had this uh, scary vision that the facade of the St. Francis Drake Hotel uh, in the fog was the monstrous face of a child eating demon named Moloch, who came to symbolize all the evils of uh, modern civilization and conformity and capitalism and uh, government. So, the people who he said were kind of lost in this, uh, this madness were not the doctors and the lawyers and the so-called respectable people. They were the uh, drug addicts and the bums and the dissidents and the jazz musicians and the poets. And the things, again, that he was speaking out against were war and government and capitalism. Is the, is the switch on the right? Can you hear me? It's blinking. It's blinking. Do we lose am, the mic? Is, am I too loud? Oh, no. I, think it, I think the mic stopped working. Hold on just one second. Sorry about that. Okay. See, they're trying to censor me already. <laughs> <laughs> Try it out. Is that better? Nope. That sounds worse. Can you hear me? 
here? No. no. <laughs> Sorry, having difficulties. <laughs> Uh, this actually led to a, a famous uh, obscenity trial that the ACLU intervened with and, uh, and won a victory. So, can I just speak without it or can I still? Can everybody, can everybody hear? Okay. You can hear. Speak up. Okay. I'm used to talking loud. So I can do that. All right. That sounds cool. <laughs> I'll be old and not too close. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn looking for an angry fix, angel-headed hipsters burning but for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo and the machinery of night, who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats floating across the tops of cities contemplating jazz, who bared their brains to heaven under the L and saw Mohammedan angels staggering on tenement roofs illuminated, who passed through universities with radiant cool eyes hallucinating Arkansas and Blake-like tragedy among the scholars of war, who cowered in unshaven rooms in underwear, burning their money in wastebaskets and listening to the terror through the walls. I'll skip ahead a little. He's talking about all the people who have lost their minds. It seems like a suitable poem for the times in which we live. Um, who lounged, oh, let's skip ahead. Who lounged hungry and lonesome through Houston seeking jazz or sex or soup. Who followed the brilliant Spaniard to con converse about America and eternity, a hopeless task, and so took ship to Africa. Who reappeared on the West Coast investigating the FBI in beards and shorts with big pacifist eyes, sexy in their dark skin, passing out incomprehensible leaflets, who burned cigarette poles in their arms, protesting the narcotic tobacco haze of capitalism, who distributed super-communist pamphlets in Union Square, weeping and undressing while the sirens of Los Alamos wailed them down, and wailed down Wall, and the Staten Island Ferry also wailed. Note the reference to Wall who broke down crying in white gymnasiums, naked and trembling before the machinery of other skeletons, who bit detectives in the neck and shrieked with delight in police cars for committing no crime but their own wild cooking pederasty and intoxication, who howled on their knees in the subway and were dragged off the roof waving genitals and manuscripts, who let themselves be fucked in the ass by saintly motorcyclists and screamed with joy, who blew and were blown by those human seraphim, the sailors, caresses of Atlantic and Caribbean love, who bawled in the morning, in the evenings, in rose gardens, and the grass of public parks, and cemeteries scattering their semen freely to whomever come they may, whoever come who may. And at this point, the San Francisco police would burst in and haul me off to jail, and this would become a nationally uh, celebrated case that the ACLU would eventually intervene in and prevail. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Mary Capello. Um, her six books of literary nonfiction include a breast cancer anti-chronicle, a Los Angeles Times bestseller on awkwardness, and most recently a book-length series on, uh, of meditations on mood. A Guggenheim and Berlin Prize recipient, she is a professor of English and Creative Writing at the University of Rhode Island. Please welcome Mary Capella. Geography of the book 
in which that scene appears. I'm going to read the opening pages instead, where um, the Dick and Jane tales are made into a kind of collapsing, mesmerizing, maddening prelude of a tale. We might hear echoes of Gertrude Stein here. And um, I hear this opening passage as a sort of beating, and uh, having been beat into one to be, raped, uh, to be raped by Dick and Jane, really. I think that's what's going on here. Um, I don't know how many of you know the book, but the Dick and Jane opening begins first with the words spaced very far apart as they might in a children's book. Then they're collapsed a little bit. And then they're collapsed all together so there is no space between the words whatsoever. That's hard to read and there's not a lot of light up here, so I'll do my best. Okay, Tony Morrison from The Blue Sky. Here is the house, it is green and white, it has a red door, it is very pretty. Here is the family, mother, father, Dick, and Jane, live in a green and white house. They are very happy. See Jane, she has a red dress, she wants to play. Who will play with Jane? See the cat, it goes meow, meow. Come and play, come play with Jane. The kitten will not play. See mother, mother is very nice, mother will you play with Jane? Mother laughs, laugh, mother laughs. See, father, he is big and strong. Father, will you play with Jane? Father is smiling, smile, father, smile. See the dog, bow wow goes the dog. Do you want to play with Jane? See the dog run, run, dog, run. Look, look, here comes a friend. The friend will play with Jane, they will play a good game. Play, Jane, play. Here's the house, it is green and white, it has a red door, it is very pretty. Here is the family, mother, father, Dick and Jane live in the green and white house. They are very happy. See Jane, she has a red dress. She wants to play. Who will play with Jane? See the cat, it goes meow, meow. Come and play, come play with Jane. The kitten will not play. See mother, mother is very nice. Mother, will you play with Jane? Mother laughs, laugh, mother laugh. See father, he is big and strong. Father will play with Jane. Father is smiling, smile, father smile. See the big bow wow goes the dog. Do you want to play? Do you want to play with Jane? See the dog run, run, dog run, look. Here comes a friend, the friend will play with Jane. They will play a good game. Play Jane, play. Here is the house that is green and white, has red door, it is very pretty. Here is the family, mother, father, Dick and Jane, live in the green and white house. They are very happy. See Jane, she has a red dress, wants to play. Wants to play. How will play with Jane? Who will play with Jane? See the cat that goes. Some meow. Come, come and play. Come play with Jane. The kitten will not play. See mother. Mother is very nice. Mother, will you play with Jane? Mother, laugh. Laugh, mother, laugh. Father, he is big and strong. Father, will you play with me? Father is smiling. Smile, father, smile. See the dog. Bow, bow, goes the dog. You want to play, do you want to play with Jane? See, run, go, run, look, 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 come see a friend, a friend will play with Jane. They will play a good game, play, Jane, play. Have you read that book? That's astonishing, right? Who has ever done that to Dick and Jane? Thank you, Tony Morrison. Um, do we have time to hear a paragraph from James Baldwin, or should I turn the book? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, so his magnum opus, Another Country. Um, uh, published in 1962, eventually became a bestseller. In 1963 in Australia, there were attempts to ban it from the country, which were later oddly tempered by trying to make it available, I love this, only to serious readers of literature who would understand. <laughs> <laughs> there were attempts to ban it from Louisiana and Georgia, not only because it depicts interracial and queer sex, but simply because it was written by a black man. Um, it's not really a favorite book of mine. I've read pretty much his entire opera, um, but um, I think that this book is really bold for its attempt to find language of the difficulty and struggle. Um, Baldwin reconciled himself to being a transatlantic commuter and lamented the fact that I am a stranger everywhere perpetually strange, and go nowhere, and I, and I see this book as a prelude, maybe, to the idea of a queer nation. There's some sense, maybe in another country we can be free, but there is no other country. So I just wanted to read two really brief passages from, from another country. One where I think the closet is so beautifully, um, beautifully represented. Okay, this is a 
about a character named Eric, who is gay, of course. In any case, he lived his life far from them at school by day and before his mirror by night, dressed up in his mother's old clothes, or whatever colorful scraps he had been able to collect, posturing and in a whisper declaiming. He knew that this was wrong too, though he could not have said why, but by this time he knew that everything he did was wrong in the eyes of his parents, in the eyes of the world, and that therefore everything must be lived in secret. The trouble with a secret life is that it is very frequently a secret from the person who lives it, and not at all a secret to the people he encounters. He encounters because he must encounter those people who see his secrecy before they see anything else, and who drag these secrets out of him, sometimes with the intention of using them against him, sometimes with more benevolent intent, but whatever the intent, the moment is awful, and the accumulating revelation is an unspeakable anguish. The aim of the dreamer, after all, is merely to go on dreaming and not to be molested by the world. His dreams are his protection against the world. But the aims of life are antithetical to those of the dreamer, and the teeth of the world are sharp. How could Eric have known that his fantasies, however unreadable they were for him, were inscribed in every one of his gestures, were betrayed in every inflection of his voice, and lived in his eyes with all the brilliance and beauty and terror of desire. He'd always been a heavy, healthy boy, had played like other children and fought as they had made friends and enemies and secret talks <coughs> and grandiose plans. <coughs> None of his playmates, after all, had ever sat with Henry in the furnace room or ever kissed Henry on his salty face. They did not wave down with discarded hats, gowns, bags, sashes, earrings, capes, and necklaces, turn themselves into make-believe characters after everyone in their house was asleep, nor did they possibly, at their most extended, have conceived of the people he and the time he had known of pain, his mother's friends, or of his mother, his mother, as he conceived her to have been when she was young. And I just want to close with a passage, another passage from this book, where um, a character named Ida is speaking, uh, an African American character is speaking to a, a white character named Cass. Okay. And this is Ida to Cass. What you people don't know, she said, is that life is a bitch, baby. It's the biggest hype going. You don't have to have any experience of paying your dues, and it's going to be rough on you, baby, when the deal goes down. There's lots of, of back dues to be collected, and I know damn well you haven't got a penny saved. Cass looked at the dark, proud head, which was half turned away from her. Do you hate white people, Ida? Ida sucked her teeth in anger. What the hell has that got to do with anything? Hell yes. Sometimes I hate them. I can see them all dead. And sometimes I don't. I do have a couple of other things to occupy my mind. Her face changed. She looked down at her finger. She twisted her ring. If any one white person gets through to you, it kind of destroys your single-mindedness. They say that love and hate are very close together, but that's a fact. She turned to the window again. To cast, ask yourself, look out and ask yourself, wouldn't you hate all white people if they kept you in prison here? <coughs> they were rolling up startling 7th Avenue. The entire population seemed to be in the streets draped almost from lampposts, hoops, and hydrants, and walking through the traffic as though it were not there. Kept you here, and stunned you, and starved you, and made you watch your mother and father and sister and lover and brother and son and daughter die, or go mad, or go under before your very eyes. And not in a hurry, like from every day to the next, but every day, every day, for years, for generations. Shit. They keep you here because you're black, the filthy white cocksuckers, while they go around jerking themselves off with all that jazz about the land of the free and the home of the brave. And they want you to jerk yourself off with that same music, too, only keep your distance. Someday, Sunny, I wish I could turn myself into one big fist and ground this mis grind this miserable country to powder. Some days. I don't believe it has a right to exist. Now, you've never felt like that. And Rivaldo's never felt like that. Rivaldo didn't want to know my brother was dying because he doesn't want to know that my brother would still be alive if he hadn't been born black. Thank you.
trying to get 